This is my IBM 5160 Personal Computer XT. A gorgeous machine with a full height floppy drive and a 10 megabyte hard drive. With only one issue, it doesn't want to start. So in this video, I'm going to give you an overview of the system and look at all of the components that could possibly cause this failure. I'll show you how you can diagnose these types of issues just by poking around with your multimeter. I'm also going to be completely disassembling the system, removing all of the expansion cards and looking at the culprit of this failure. And I'm going to show you how we can fix this issue. In a follow-up video, I will be going over every single component in a lot more detail. But the goal of this video is to fix the issue and get the machine up and running again. Let's take a couple of steps back to the point where I got the system. Now the seller told me that when he tried to start it, he would hear the fan of the power supply kicking in, but nothing would come on the screen. And this is exactly what is happening here. So we turn on the computer, we hear the power supply unit spinning, but nothing is showing up on the screen. So something is definitely wrong and we'll need to investigate. Now, the IBM 5160 is actually made up of a couple of components. We have the power supply unit, which is connected to the main board. We have a disk drive and a hard drive. Now, the power supply supplies power to the main board and all the peripherals, to the disk drive and the hard drive. So any of these components can be faulty, and the power supply itself also. First thing we want to do is we want to disconnect all of the power consumers from the power supply. So this includes the main board. And I'm also going to be disconnecting it from the hard drive and the disk drive. So now the power supply is completely disconnected from all of the components from the computer and we can test it in isolation. So using a multimeter, I'm just going to check to see if the power supply outputs the correct voltages. I'm going to be using this Molex connector here because I have easy access to the ground 5 volts and the 12 volt rail. So I'm going to be using ground here as a reference. I'm going to hook up my probe to the 12 volt line, set the multimeter into the voltage setting and start the power supply. So as soon as I flip the switch, you can see that I have 11.17 volts on the 12 volt rail. Now that's a bit low, but I mean, it is acceptable. So let's check the five volt rail. I'm again going to be using ground as a reference and hooking up to the five volt rail. And here we have 5.48 volts, which is okay. So there are no shorts on the power supply on the five volt and 12 volt rail. So that's already good. But we also need to check the other voltages that the power supply outputs. So these are located on the power supply connector that goes into the main board. So there we can check other voltages such as the minus 12 volts, which we see here. And we can also check the minus 5 volt rail. So all of these are outputting the correct voltages. So that means that the power supply is probably okay. So I've hooked up the power supply back to the main board because I want to see if there are any shorts that are caused by the main board or by any of the expansion cards which are on the main board. So I'm going to be using ground as a reference here and I'm going to set my multimeter into the ohm settings and I'm going to check to see what the resistance is between the ground rail and the other voltages. So you can see here I'm probing the 12 volt rail and I have 23 ohms. So that's definitely not a short. I'm going to be hooking it up to the 5 volt rail. There I have 18 ohms, which is also not a short. Now I'm also going to be checking the other rails, which are on the system board itself. So I'll need to probe the actual power connector, which is going to the system board. I'm going to check all of the rails there to see if there are any shorts and there doesn't appear to be any. So my guess is that we can now try to turn on the computer with 
only the power supply attached to the system board and the peripherals and not having the disk drive and hard drive connected. So let's flip the switch and see what we've got. So we see the computer going through its memory test. So that means that the main board and the expansion cards are probably working fine. So we'll need to search for the culprit elsewhere. So we've attached the power supply to the system board and its peripherals and it seemed to boot fine. So it either is going to be the disk drive or the hard drive. I'm going to put my money on the disk drive. So let's hook up the hard drive and see if it still boots. So I'm going to be attaching the power connector back to the hard drive. So it's a very tight fit here. But with the hard drive connected, let's take our multimeter, set it to the ohms setting and see if we haven't introduced any shorts on the 5 volt and the 12 volt rail, which are the two rails that are being used by hard drives and disk drives. And it doesn't seem to be the case. Let's check the 5 volts. So we have 12 ohms, so we should be good to go. So let's start the computer with the hard drive attached and leaving only the disk drive disconnected. So I'm going to be speeding up the memory test as it takes a very long time to test all of the memory. But after a while we will get the disk drive error. So we hit F1 to continue. And we see that the hard drive is kicking in and the computer is actually starting from the hard drive. So excellent. So we have found our culprit. So all we need to do now is get it out. Now on these IBMs, there is a screw at the bottom of the case that we need to remove. So as you can see, it's located here. So we're going to be taking our screwdriver and removing it. So on my IBM, only one screw is attached. Normally there are two. I'm currently unscrewing the one for the hard drive as I'm going to be taking out all the components. So for the hard drive, we also need to remove the two screws here at the side, and then we can slide out the entire thing. So don't forget to remove all of the cables and the power cable before we actually remove the hard drive. So here we have it, our Seagate 412, a 10 megabyte hard drive manufactured by Seagate. And placed in pretty much all of the IBM XT computers. Now the disk drive is attached with two screws which are located here. So we need to remove the expansion cards in order to get to the screws. So here we have our Hercules compatible monochrome card. Next up is a very big card that serves multiple purposes. It's the six pack plus from AST, acts as a memory expansion, real-time clock, offers serial ports, parallel port. So the next card we'll be removing is the IBM fixed disk adapter. So it's the hard drive controller card, which is only capable of working with this Seagate 10 megabyte hard drive. So it cannot accept any other drives. Next up is the IBM floppy drive controller, capable of hooking up uh, 360K floppy drives. And finally, we are arrived to our last expansion card, which is the IBM Async card, offering one serial RS-232 serial port. So with all of the expansion cards out of the way, we can finally go what we intended to do all along, which is to remove the disk drive so we can take a closer look. So with all of the screws removed, now it's just a matter of sliding out the floppy drive out of the case. And we can take a closer look. So it's a full height 360 kilobyte floppy drive. A Tandon model TM102A, which is kind of the official drive that went into all of the IBM 5160s. And on one of these circuit boards here, 
there is a failure. So let's take a look. Now, the first thing that we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna remove the top PCB here uh, so that we can have a little bit more of an easy access to it. So I'm gonna be removing all of the connectors and unscrewing the two screws that hold it in place and free the PCB from the floppy drive. So with the PCB removed, it's time to check if we still have the short on this particular PCB, because if it's not the case, then it's going to be elsewhere in the disk drive. But for now, I'm assuming that it's gonna be on this board. So let's fire up our multimeter. Let's put it on the ohm setting and check the 12 volt rail where we see an obvious short. Now this is obviously something that we'll need to fix. So when we look at the circuit board close to the 12 volt rail, we see a number of capacitors. So I'm guessing most likely one of these is gonna be bad. Now figuring out which one isn't the easiest task because everything on the 12 volt rail will be shorted. So I'm just gonna be poking around with my multimeter and trying to find the capacitors which are on the 12 volt rail and then try to find out which one is causing the short. So here, for example, this blue capacitor here is a good candidate. It is shorted, so it's on the 12 volt rail. So let's take a closer look at this one. I'm going to be desoldering this capacitor or at least try to get one leg freed because it is pretty difficult to test these types of things in circuit because there will be lots of capacitors on the 12 volt rail. So if we remove it from the circuit, we'll get a much better uh, idea of what is going on. So here I'm just loosening up the pins so that hopefully on the other side, I will be able to, to uh, get out the capacitor or at least get one leg off of the capacitor. And that's what I've done here. So I have one leg removed. So the short here is gone, it's gone over limit. But when I do a, uh, a measurement on the capacitor, we can see that the two legs are shorted. So this capacitor is definitely bad. So this is a 4.7 microfarad 16 volt capacitor. I don't have a tantalum replacement for it. I do have an electrolytic capacitor that I can use as a replacement. This will be a temporary fix. Um, obviously you'll want to replace this with another tantalum capacitor, but as I'm guessing that this type of capacitor is either used for filtering or smoothing the 12 volt power supply going into the disk drive, it won't really matter all that much. Normally the disk drive should work with this electrolytic capacitor as well. And while we have the circuit board removed from the disk drive, I'm just gonna take this opportunity to clean the drive heads with some isopropyl alcohol. So we can get through the, to the drive head very easily with the circuit board off. So yeah. So I'm gonna clean both sides of the head. And we're going to be putting our circuit board back onto the drive with our new electrolytic capacitor soldered on. And then we can see if the disk drive works. So I'm going to be hooking up all of the connectors again. And then we'll see how it goes. Now, because I had already removed every component from the case, I've created this little test setup here with my ATX power supply. I have the main board, I have the disk drive controller, video card, monitor, and the disk drive. So I have an MS-DOS bootable disk. As I don't have a hard drive attached to it now, I'll need to boot from the floppy. So this will be a good test to see if the disk drive works. So I'm powering on the system and the disk drive is reading the disk just fine. So at that point, we know that we have fixed the floppy drive issue and the computer is starting. It can read the disk, no issues there. So I think this is a good fix. So let's assemble everything back together. So we're gonna put the hard drive back into the case.
at our floppy drive with our new capacitor. Put back all of the expansion cards back onto the main board. Hook up the disk drive. Hook up the hard drive. Add our memory expansion and video card. And now we have a fully functional IBM 5160 PC XT again with a working hard drive and a working floppy drive. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. So the focus of this video was fixing the issue of the computer not starting. Next videos will include a more in-depth overview of the system, a comparison with the original IBM PC, the 5150, and me installing some cool software on this 5160. So if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you like this kind of content and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.